can move on now and talk about funding. To what extent do you think it makes sense to have one funding body for further education, another for higher education, and yet another for pre-19 education? It doesn't make sense to have a complex, convoluted, opaque system. The system at the present has been described, I think, as opaque, obtuse and obscure. It is hard to navigate both for learners, uh, for teachers and for employers. So we need a simple funding streams that get as much money as possible to the sharp end. That's why I want universities that are much freer to make decisions relevant to the needs of the economy and responding to the wishes and talents of, of trainees, of, people, of students. It's why I want FE to be free from some of the bureaucracy which Sir Andrew Foster for the government described as a galaxy of oversight. It's why I want good advice and guidance for potential trainees and students so they can be directed to the right courses best suited to their aptitudes. At the moment we have an immensely bureaucratic system as you describe. We certainly want a more straightforward one. I would probably reinvent a further education funding council of some kind. It might be called the Skills Funding Agency. The government have that in mind. But I'd certainly make that a slim structure with much more independence for the people delivering training. Uh, and that means a lot more self-regulation. It means peer review. It means uh, having robust mechanisms to deal with both the quality of teaching and learning and probity. But beyond that, saying to people, you know what the government's broad objectives are. We want you to devise ways of delivering those objectives which are responsive to your locale. And that's the faith we need to place in professionals who will rejuvenate the system and uh, allow it to grow up. Let's stop treating further education and the people who deliver skills uh, as, uh, as infants. Let's treat them as the grown-ups they are. Trust in their ability to deliver the solutions that our economy needs and that our people deserve. I think you've answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you think that the Labour government have made the present system of qualifications for learners, for developers, for educators and trainers too complicated? And what would a Conservative government do differently? The Labour government's lack of skills have damned a people to a circumstance where the skills gaps that are damaging their, their life chances and damaging our economy as a whole. Uh, uh, and that's not acceptable. We want, um, we want a system that delivers people what they, as I said, deserve, uh, which is the opportunity to become more skilled, to prosper in those terms, not just because of the economic value they can then bring, but the sense of worth and purpose and achievement that that gives people. When people acquire skills, they acquire purpose, they acquire pride, uh, and actually they grow, they acquire fulfillment. Uh, and that's why I believe so strongly in practical skills, it's why I believe so strongly in the further education agenda. This is not simply about serving the needs of economy, although that matters of course, it's also about people's lives and their life chances, their role as democratic citizens in an elevated society where we all play our part and all feel valued. There's just three things really that I think summarise my thinking on this. The first is that we have to elevate the practical. We have to understand that not the only form of accomplishment is book learning. That people through the acquisition of all sorts of practical talents and skills can make a bigger contribution to society and can become bigger people as a result. Let's have faith in all of those vocational and practical skills which matter so much. The second thing I'd want to say is the way we teach and learn needs to be immensely flexible. It needs to be responsive and, it, and reflect the dynamism of an increasingly advanced economy. That means looking again at part-time learning, at distance learning, at modular learning, allowing people to reskill and upskill at a pace which suits them which matches the rhythm of their lives, bringing more mature learners, uh, more people from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, more people with children, more returning women who are coming back into the workplace, giving them their chance to prosper too. And the third thing I'd say is all of that depends on us elevating the role of the teacher too. Every great civilization has valued the role of the educator. You think of ancient Rome and Greece, of Persia and China and Egypt, and it would be a nonsense 
in Western society, in our kingdom now, to do anything less. We need to believe in the power of learning and the role of educators, the almost mystical relationship between the teacher and the taught. And when we believe in that, we will encourage those trainers and teachers to inspire a new generation to new heights. That's what our forefathers aimed for. Rudd Butler, when he introduced the 1944 Education Act, talked about education for democratic citizenship. Well, I say we should aim for no less of our generation in our era. Let's be bold and ambitious for what we can achieve. As politicians, we can make, play our part, but much more important are the teachers and the learners that really make a difference.